ASU 2014-04 relates to the reclassification of residential mortgage loans upon foreclosure. This ASU was issued in January of 2014 and came out of the EITF discussions that took place in November of 2013. My name is Jack Pullman and I'm here with Jason Parsons and we're going to cover some of the key points that took place in the EITF discussion around this issue and some of the key points that are in the ASU. Jason, can you lead us off and provide a background on the issue? Thanks, Jack. I'm sure by now we're all familiar with the financial crisis that began back in 2007-2008 and what happened to the residential real estate market as a result of the, the financial crisis. Um, we saw a significant spike in foreclosure activity. Um, and while we, you know we're sitting here in you know spring of 2014, in a lot of that pipeline of foreclosures, you know, it may be emptying. Um, it may not be. We may be over the so-called peak of the foreclosures. However, the, the guidance that the, the EITF spent some time discussing and what has become the, the you know, final ASU in 2014-04 is still relevant. Um, we certainly may. This may not be the last time that we have a spike in foreclosures. And the, the guidance in the ASU will, will, will certainly drive some more consistency in the reporting uh, among all entities. A little bit of background, you know, the foreclosure process can certainly be lengthy, certainly for residential mortgages, um, and there, there's a couple reasons for this, some of the, the most, most obvious of which are that the rules can really vary state by state and oftentimes even county by county. And with, with the varying rules and the varying, uh, the, it can cause some differences in the, in the foreclosure process, and it can really change the timing. Um, as kind of a reminder, this ASU is only for consumer loans, not for commercial loans. I, you know, around the commercial loan process, it, it generally moves through in foreclosure much quicker, and we don't run into some of the same issues as we do having to do with consumer loans. So the ASU does address only consumer loans. I, under the old guidance, we, when we talked about when to recategorize or reclassify a loan to Oreo, I, you know, it was... The, the guidance would tell us that you know, a trouble debt restructuring that was in substance a repossession or foreclosure by the creditor, or that is when the creditor received physical possession of the debtor's assets, regardless of whether formal foreclosure proceedings had taken place. All right, so that's kind of a mouthful. And, and you know, what does it mean? Well, part of the problem was is that under the old guidance, there was really no definition of the terms in substance, a repossession or foreclosure, and physical possession. The accounting literature didn't really consider these, so there was therefore some diversity in practice and, and how the different uh, banks would apply these these terms and how they would define them and really determine when they would move something into Oreo. Thanks, Jason. So what does this mean for a lender? Can you walk us through an example? Sure thing, Jack. Let me kind of just go through kind of the basic fact pattern. Um, you know, a, a, Typical scenario would be one where a bank has a delinquent loan. Uh, generally, the borrower would have no equity or perhaps very little equity in the property. Um, usually, they're underwater and that the, the, the value, the, outs the, the outstanding mortgage exceeds and in many times far exceeds the, the, the fair value of the, of the property. Uh, so the bank would initiate the foreclosure process. Um, oftentimes, the, the homeowner will vacate the property so that the property is empty. Uh, the bank will have access to the property. They may be maintaining the property. And this could even include the, the bank paying insurance and, and or property taxes. Then the, as the bank will move through then the foreclosure process, the bank will obtain legal title through foreclosure or perhaps a, a completed deed in lieu of foreclosure. And that's, that kind of, that's kind of the, the basic process of going through a kind of a typical fact pattern. So, Jason, when in the process, you know, should a bank reclassify uh, the loan to Oreo? Should it be when the homeowner vacates the property, when the bank is maintain, maintaining the property, or, or when the bank, at a later point in time, when the bank receives legal title? What was the, the view on that? It's, it's a really good question, Jack, and it's, and it's really what the, kind of the purpose of the ASU w was going to, is to put some more, some more kind of bright line definitions around when that reclassification should take place, and really to, re to re reduce the diversity in practice and, and drive consistent reporting. Um, in the scenario that, that we described, uh, a bank would wait in the process until that time at which they either have legal title through foreclosure 
or a completed deed in lieu of foreclosure, and that would be the point at which they would reclassify to OREO. The ASU 2014-04 gave us a more clear-cut definition and kind of clearer guidance for when that reclassification to OREO would take place. Um, we, we had some terms in kind of the, 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 the former guidance, if you will, that, that the definition wasn't clear. And the ASU, the, the most obvious change is really putting a definition to those terms. What does it mean for the, the bank to have received physical possession, um, resulting in an in-substance repossession or foreclosure? Um, what, are the, what, are, what are the terms around when that has occurred? And that way, and then with that definition, we'll have more consistency in when that reclassification to OREO takes place. There were really two two uh, scenarios upon which the in, in the final ASU, where you have an event that's occurred where the bank has taken title and you, the reclassification to OREO should 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 be made. The first is the creditor or the bank actually obtaining legal title to the residential real estate property through the foreclosure process. Um, this should seem pretty clear. It's the, the foreclosure process has kind of run its course, and the bank has received title. Alternatively, uh, the bank could have also uh, received completion of a deed in lieu of foreclosure. Uh, at times, uh, the, the bank and the, the borrower may come to an agreement and to maybe perhaps shorten or to just kind of work through the foreclosure process more quickly, where alternatively, instead of going through the foreclosure process to completion, they can come into a, 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 an agreement and you'll have the, the deed in lieu of foreclosure. And at that point, title will have transferred to the bank as well. So Jason, did the EITF have any thoughts as to when a bank may have protective rights in a property? Uh, or perhaps how borrower redemption rights were considered. Um, I do know that, you know, it seems like the bank regulators sometimes take the view that physical possession occurs at a point earlier in time than when legal possession occurs. What was the EITF's thought process around that? It's a good, good question, and there certainly was some discussion by the EITF around around just the just those those questions as well, uh, having to do with protective rights. Uh, there was some concern that it, even if if you were to look at sort of uh, protective rights and when the bank has an interest or in in maintaining the property, you're still left with some judgment. It's it's not as clear of a definition, and perhaps it doesn't going to that sort of model really wouldn't drive the consistency in reporting that the EITF and you know would, was was trying to resolve by this question having come up. So the, the conclusion was is that if you move to a, a model where it's clear-cut that title has transferred to the bank either through the foreclosure process or the completion of a deed in lieu of foreclosure, you really remove a lot of the judgment from the process and you, get, you end up with all of the lenders re recording them consistently. Um, with borrower redemption rights, this was another kind of uh, question that the ITF dealt with. Uh, there being some concern, or so the question came up that even after a foreclosure, oftentimes the borrowers may have redemption rights, and that the the, the title may be encumbered. Um, the thought process by you know, couple couple di different issues there. On the one side, the title has in fact transferred. So even though the, the the borrower still has some redemption rights, in theory they could exercise them if they could come forward and you know essentially satisfy the loan. For some t period of time, they could do that. However, in reality, if the borrower was unable to make the monthly payments, became delinquent, found themselves in the for foreclosure process, wasn't able to cure, property went through foreclosure, and at no point could they you know, come current, it it's highly unlikely that during some type of, uh, of redemption period, the borrower is suddenly going to come up with the funds to... to go back and somehow pay off the mortgage and in reality this is this is what happens we we, we very rarely see um, any type of redemption rights actually being exercised upon we do have two new disclosure requirements with ASU 2014-04 the first of which is to disclose the amount of OREO outstanding at the balance sheet date 
and the second is to disclose the recorded investment in residential real estate loans that are in the process of foreclosure. The task force noted that the real estate risk exposure is really of, of, of main or primary interest to the investors and the users of these financial statements and felt that disclosing these two incremental amounts would, re would really address those risks. For ASU 2014 for the transition, for the effective date for our public companies, it's going to be annual periods beginning after December 15, 2014 and interim periods within those years. For our non-publics, it's going to be uh, similarly annual periods but be beginning after December 15, 2014. However, it'll be interim periods for the annual periods beginning after December 15, 2015. So for our non-publics, we have kind of a one-year lag for those that have some, some interim period reporting requirements. Early adoption is permitted. Um, and from the transition guidance, uh, the entities will have a choice between either a prospective application or a modified retrospective. However, it, it, in practice, we do expect most that will, that, that will be adopting this to take a prospective application of, approach, it, just given that if, if you were to go with a modified retrospective, it's possible that for an entity that was reclassifying to Oreo earlier in the process, they could move something out of Oreo only to move it back to Oreo two, three, four months later. So uh, the expectation is most would look at a, a prospective application. In our, and, and you know the, the sense is, is that a lot of the entities are already recording this consistent with the ASU, but it will drive consistency across all lenders. We'd like to thank you for listening to the update on ASU 2014-04, Reclassification of Residential Real Estate Collateralized Consumer Mortgage Loans Upon Foreclosure. This concludes KPMG's podcast on ASU 2014-04, Reclassification of Residential Real Estate Collateralized Consumer Mortgage Loans Upon Foreclosure. You can find more information on the Financial Reporting Network. Thank you for listening.